right. Good evening. And tonight we have another special guest. Um, we will be meeting with Coach Tanja Buford Bailey. Uh, Ashley, thank you for joining us again as well. Um, so before we get started, let me run down Coach Tanja's resume really quickly. It's kind of long, so it may take me a second here. Uh, first, <laughs> <laughs> first, you are known as the University of Illinois' greatest female athlete. That's pretty big. Okay. And you still got that title. You were the Illini's right. most outstanding <laughs> athlete from 1990 to 93. So in high school, four-time state champ. So you were nice in high school, of course. And in college, 10-time All-American, Big Ten Athlete of the Year four times. Uh, in 92, you won four events at the Big Ten meet, the 100, the 100 hurdles, the four hurdles, and you won the winning relay. Was that the four by four or the four by one? I won five events. Five events. Oh, I'm sorry. So, okay, what's your event? That year, I didn't run 400 hurdles. I ran uh -huh. the one and the two, the, the 100 hurdles, and both of the relays. So you pretty yeah. much won the conference championship My coach, he mixed it up so we could get points. You know, he mixed yeah. it up. That's a lot of points, mm -hmm. especially you winning cool. everything. Tanya Williams okay. ran, ran and won the 400 hurdles. Okay, okay. Oh, your teammate. Your teammate Tanya yeah, so, was my teammate. So, mm -hmm. so you, guys you guys dominated. ended up winning the Big Ten Champions that year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, yep. let me finish. You, you still have a, a lot of stuff here. So NCAA champion mm -hmm. in 92 in the 400 hurdles. You're a three-time Olympian. In 95, you were a world championship silver medalist in the four hurdles with a time of 52-62, which at the time that actually was faster than the world record. Amazing. Um, 96, you, you got an Olympic bronze in the 400 hurdles. And your time of 52-62 is actually currently still number seven all time. So still one of the best ever. Uh, on to your coaching career. Two times Midwest region, head women's coach of the year. 25 Big Ten individual and relay titles. A member of the 2012 Olympic team coaching staff. Uh, 2016 USATF Nike coach of the year while at Texas, becoming the first female to be honored since the inception of the award in 1998, and through your career coaching a number of All-Americans and national champions, including Courtney Okolo, the reigning indoor 400 meter champion and world record holder on the mixed relay. Whew. Oh, four-time Olympic medalist coach as well with two golds, a silver and a bronze. That's a resume. I mean, that, that took a while. A very impressive coach. Um, yeah, and it's Go ahead. It's Women's History Month, so it's good to know that we have the first female Nike um, honored coach. So that's impressive as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Absolutely. guys. I think you mentioned the 25 Big Ten Championships. That was as an athlete, not a coach. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. It was just also, it was so much. I'm probably yeah, sure I missed I, some I, mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I had 25 Big Ten I don't know. That. Are you sure? We had a lot, though. Uh, we had a lot, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you might, you may have. I don't know. So um, I don't know. And and like I was mentioning, uh, you asked me before. We actually have met before. I actually got my coaching career started at Illinois as a volunteer. I volunteer volunteered there for a few months while you were there, and uh, we met just. Who was the briefly. head coach? Um, I was volunteering for Wayne Angel. Wayne. Mm-hmm. Got yep, it. yep. So I was there for a few months with my old uh, coach, Charles Goffin. I don't know if you remember that guy. Oh, he told yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interest, interesting character. Hey, Champagne is a cool, Champagne is a cool place, isn't it? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. You don't think so? No, I Champagne like is, people are asleep on how, Champagne is a very nice city. It I mean, it's a very nice town. Nice city. It's it's a and I enjoyed it's, it. It's close proximity to other big cities, so you can always get a little mixture of hometown stuff and then drive an hour or so. Drive to Chicago, so, yeah. Indianapolis, yeah. St. Louis. Yeah. <laughs> nah, so you're the best of both worlds, for sure. I enjoyed it. It was a little cold, kind of like Ithaca, but, you know, and I was volunteering at the time, so I kind of was broke. So, I mean, that kind of affected my enjoyment of the yeah, area. Yeah, you never, you're never <laughs> happy when you're broke, sorry. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So Under how'd you get circumstances? Yeah, but that's that was the start of my coaching career, volunteering at Illinois. So it was Great. pretty cool yeah. being there for the mm -hmm. short time that I was there and getting to work with some of the really good athletes that I got to work with that short time there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So how'd you get started in track? You were, you know, obviously you were kicking butt in high school, but when did it start for you? 
I started running when I was eight. Okay, wow. AAU, USA Pay, TAC was what it used to be called at the Track Athletics Congress way before, you know, uh, the fancy names. But um, yeah, I started when I was eight, um, really just running on the playground, kind of noticed I was faster than other kids. Um, and then I remember one day sitting in, cl in class, maybe second grade or something, and they announced, you know, like at the end of the day, they have all the announcements. And they mentioned that there was a track club. And I was like, wait a minute, you can actually do this organized? And so that was a, a big deal. And I took the flyer and I took it home and was begging my mother and father. And they was like, uh-uh, it costs $20. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, please, you gotta hook us up. You know, me and my, so me and my little sister, we started, uh, I was eight, she was seven. And um, that's really where we started. And um, by and I was on a really good club team. So by the time I was like nine and ten, we were starting to do national national level stuff on relays. Oh, so that early? Okay, so it got a little bit of yeah, travel like, to different. I mean, places. I wasn't a national level. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I was a national level athlete at that age. I know you know we were you know we were functioning well, but I, uh, mm -hmm. but in terms of like going to nationals and stuff, it would mainly be on relays back when I was younger because my coach didn't really. You know, if you went until you were like high school, he really didn't like you to do a lot of individual national stuff. He liked you to kind of earn your way on relays, which I think is actually kind of cool because it takes the pressure off yeah. of, you know, you really young, young athletes. So that was kind of cool. Now that I look back, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was no, that's great. a great point. Absolutely. And in high school, did you know that you were good? Because you said that you were beating the other kids and everything, but did you actually know that you had the talent or did you just still see it as just something where that was fun? No, like, I, so I started hurdling. Um, I, I, I had that late birthday. So my birthday's in December. So I was always at that, the bottom of the age group running against older girls. Mm -hmm. So um, I always thought it was a negative back then because I was never at the top of my age group. And I'm like, man, if I was the top of my age group, I'd be doing this, you know? So, um, but I was able to start hurdling early because I think you could start at age 12, 13. So I was like 11 starting hurdles and uh, just kind of figuring that out. But no, actually what happened to me is I started doing 200 hurdles and then 400 hurdles. And actually in Syracuse, New York, um, I ran this 400 hurdle race and I ran really, 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 really fast. Um, and it was like an age group record and everything at the time I was 14. So I think I was 13 running in, no, I was 14 running in the 15, 16 age group. And um, that was one of the things that actually made me end up not running the race at a higher level because I was kind of like chasing this. I think I ran like a 59 or a 60 something when I was that young mm -hmm. and I could never run faster than that, right? So that was going into high school. Then I went into high school and I started running 300 hurdles and I started doing well in hundred hurdles. And then every time I ran 400 hurdles, I would run slower than I was when I was, you know, 14. And then I became 17 and I couldn't run as fast as I was when I was 14. And then I was 19 and I couldn't run as fast as I was when I was 14. And I was just like, this is debilitating. Like it was mentally debilitating for me. So I just got to the point where I was like, I don't ever want to run 400 hurdles anymore. I'm a short hurdler, I'm a sprinter and um, you know, my coach came to me, Gary Winkler, who was my college coach and he, and professional coach. And he was just like, you're a 400 hurdler. So pretty much that's what you're going to do. Um, that's what you're going to be great in. Like he like told me, he knew, he was like, this is what you're going to be great in. We just, we're going to, we have to figure it out. And so my freshman year, I was, you know, I was playing the con game. Hey, if, if I can score really high in the 200 at big 10, can I not have to run the 400 hurdles? <laughs> If I do this in the 100 hurdles, can I not have to run the 400 hurdles? And I mean, I, I was running that event and it was horrible. Like it was, it, it was making me not even want to go to track meets. This is in college. And I was running very well in college. I was a uh, 10 champ in 100 meters, um, second at, in the conference in the two. I was the only freshman to make nationals that year in the 100 hurdles as a freshman. But I had this monkey on my back about the 400 hurdles. So I had thought I had worked my way out of that after freshman year, I come back sophomore year and my coach had a meeting with me and he was like, you either gonna run 400 hurdles or you can, you can do it. <laughs> and, but, that, but that's how it was back then. You know, you didn't like negotiate with athletes and stuff no, back no, then. And I was no, like, no, oh no. man, like I'm the best one on the team and my coach trying to get rid of me, you know? 
but I understood it and I really trusted him. So I knew like he knew what he was doing and I knew that it was something that I just had to figure out. So um, my sophomore year, I really started saying, let me try to really pay attention and figure out what is happening here. Cause I know I'm a better athlete. And so once I really figured out the, the rhythm of the race and understood what I was supposed to be doing with my arms and all, cause I was a great hurdler, but it was that other part of it. And then just one race, it just clicked. And once I ran like, cause I was running like 60s and 61s and 62s and I was doing great in all these other events. And then just one race, I ran like a 57 low. So, I, so it was like a huge three or four second improvement. And once I did that, it was over. I was like, oh, I'm good now. And that, that became the event that I focused on the most. And um, that so same year I got, I made Pan Am games and got a medal at Pan Am games. In the so, event that I really refuse to run. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, yeah. a lot of folks, um, they start track early because you started track at a pretty young age. And then you see some folks mm -hmm. who they were really good and then they hit that wall where they don't see improvement. And it sounds like in that one event, you were having a hard time where you just weren't able to run faster in that event. What do you mainly attribute that to? Well, you know, I'll answer that two ways. One, what you mentioned about starting young, I did start young, but like I mentioned, the reason that I never got burnt out is because there was no pressure on me when I was a young athlete. Like we ran yeah. everything. We ran hurdles. We ran, the, I ran the one, I ran the two, the four. Um, I, I ran the eight a couple of times, which I wasn't good at. I ran cross country, like, you know, just everything. And there was never a time where I was, yeah, never specialized. And there was an, and I played basketball and stuff, but there was a, never a point where I felt like as a young athlete that there was any pressure for me to win or run fast or think about times or anything like that when I was young, ever. I don't ever remember even being concerned about what place I finished or time until deep into high school. Okay, so that was for me and my experience. Um, to answer your, the other question is, as, as, as track runners, we get so focused on the clock. And so the problem that I was having with that event was I had this time. It wasn't the event that was the monkey on my back. It was that mark and that time that I felt like every single time that I ran and I, I didn't achieve that, that I was a failure, right? Yeah. So I could do all these other things and feel like I wasn't a failure, but I do this one thing. And it, if I didn't run as didn't matter if I won or, or whatever, because I was winning some 400 hurdles, but I always felt like a failure. And yeah. it was easier wow. for me, like it is for most human beings to avoid things that you know you're not gonna do well at, right? Mm -hmm. Because no one wants to feel like a failure. So um, it took years and years and years and years and years for me to kind of get that out of my head. Um, until I just said, okay, I am forced to do it. My back is up against the wall, so I have to make it work, you know? Yeah. So um, I think there are a lot of athletes that do run into that. And then you even have at the next level, athletes who run really well in college. Well, now they're professionals. And I'll tell you, there's something about college track that you're running every weekend, you're sharp, you're kind of in a bubble in, in the fact that your life is being controlled, right? That is, that is the easiest way to be successful is to have someone else control your life, right? So then you become a professional and it seems so much harder. Everything that you thought seemed easy seems so much harder, but it's, it's not. It actually was really hard when you were a college runner. You were <laughs> always up against the gun because the competition is so tough. You're running week in and week week out, which means you're getting a lot of races, you're very sharp, and then your life is controlled. Someone tells you when to be at every place, at what time, and then you're also balancing that with the, the, um, the education side of it. So um, to put in perspective, it's a lot easier, it's a lot harder to be a college athlete than it is to be a professional athlete, but I just don't think that sometimes the professional athletes put as much focus in the one thing, which is the, the priority is track and field, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're in college, you can't get away from the priority because the priority is right there. And then it's scheduled for you, right? So you're not really able to 
be distracted as much as, as you are when, when that's not all you're doing. So, um, so then you have professionals that really struggle with why aren't, aren't I running as fast as I was running in college, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you start to put that, I, I'm older, I'm faster, I have a professional coach, um, all these things that go through your head, like I should be better and um, really just go back to the basics. You know, what, what helped you? So my coach always coached me like a college athlete. Like he, that's mm -hmm. the schedule we went off of, you know, tried to race me as much as possible. Uh, we start training when the college kids started training, <laughs> you know, just kind of stay on that schedule and, and instead of, um, so I, I kind of coach that way too. Now I'm like, let's, let's follow the collegiate pattern because not only is it, is a great uh, pattern for the sport, yeah. but it's also something that you're familiar with that you've been successful with. So why try to reinvent the wheel, you know? So I think yeah. sometimes when people run are young and they run really fast, they get caught up into um, the pressure now of having to really beat yourself. Mm -hmm. And and as a coach, did you they encounter this? Constantly the trying to yourself and beat the current time that you're going after. So how did you change your perspective while you were going um, from the hundred hurdles, the two hundred, etc., to the four hundred hurdles? Because you made the Olympic team while you were in college as well. Yeah. So that that's kind of that's kind of funny because um, I told you that sophomore year was kind of like the breakthrough year, I, I did uh, qualify for Pan Ams and World Student Games, ran well there. And then the next year, of course, I came in with a totally different mentality. Uh, first of all, I needed to lose weight. That's just a fact. Um, so that was one of the things I really started focusing on at the beginning of the fall training. Um, and then by um, the time the season progressed, of course, I had more opportunities to run the race because like I said, in college, you get to run every weekend. So I had more opportunities to run the way, race to kind of um, refine my skills there. And then going into the NCAA meet, which happened to be in Austin, Texas that year in 1992, um, I just kind of ran my way through the rounds, right? Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go in as a favorite or anything, but just kind of each round got better and better. And I was like, okay, until got to the point where um it's so funny because Quincy Watts you guys know who he is right mm -hmm. so he he ran the 400 right before my event went off and like he killed it broke the collegiate record for like 4350 um Ooh. I'm a statistician so I, <laughs> I I can throw numbers up but anyway he ran like 4350 and I was like oh okay we're running today <laughs> um and then he was like he said something to me like you next and I was like you're right I'm next <laughs> you know that was it so I was like hype so I went and uh, after I won that, then I was like, okay, well going to Olympic trials. And again, that was for experience, just kind of, you know, have that experience of going to the trials. And because it was so funny, you know, they, they announced where the Olympics is gonna be probably five years before because the whole city is bidding and whatever, right? So we know where the next Olympics is gonna be now, right? So, and this was maybe 92 and they had announced that in 96 was gonna be Atlanta. And I was devastated because I hadn't really gone out of the country month. And I'm like, no, you know, when you think of the Olympics, uh -huh. you think of these Atlanta, exotic yeah. cities, you know, Seoul and Tokyo. And, and I was like, I don't want, I want to, I want to go somewhere fancy when I go to the Olympics, you know, uh -huh. because in that you're already, you know, claiming it. Like, I, I know I'm going to be on the 96 team. So uh, I wanted to go somewhere fancy. I'm mad that it's in Atlanta. I done been to Atlanta, blah, blah, blah. And so um, that year, I'm thinking I'm just going to the trials to have some fun, learn some things. And again, each round, it just, I was just setting myself up in a good position, going through the semi, setting myself up in a good position, having a good lame in the final. And then at that, you just run for it and snuck up and got second. <laughs> so that wasn't something that was really, you know, expected or going in like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to make this team. I really was just going in there to learn some things. So you know, again, I think the less pressure you put on yourself, the the better you are, right? Because you can't force something to happen. So just be as prepared as possible and, you know, do what comes naturally for you, but don't put this enormous amount of pressure on your back to um, for a certain thing to happen because you really can't control it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that was, definitely a test to in, um, college was cool because um, like I said, I think it did help me for the ones to come down the road, so. I think that um, your story attests to when preparation meets opportunity. 
and you just let it happen as, as opposed to just like forcing something to happen because your greatest times in high school and in college and um, making the Olympic team was there's no pressure on yourself. You didn't have any target on your back or anything. You were just going in there to just do what you had to do. And you were right. prepared for greatness, as you can see. Mm -hmm. How do you um, explain or talk about that to your athletes? Having them to explain, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself. We do what we do in practice and, you know, certain things should just happen. It's hard, but I think um, the, again, the easiest way for um, them to see it is to do it, right? So you have to model a lot in training what you're going to do in the race, but I think you also have to race a lot too. So I think where we are now is we've missed a lot of racing opportunities with COVID. So you missed almost a whole, there's never a time unless you're injured or something like that, where you don't have a really good full season the year before the Olympic games. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so that really hurt. So, you know, we were coming off of 2019 and it was supposed to be 2020 when now we're going into an Olympic year where we really didn't even race last year. And then you're kind of scrambling for races now. It wasn't a lot of indoor opportunities because now the colleges have totally eliminated us. You yeah. know, they're like, we're just trying to survive with our own COVID protocols. We can't have all these randoms now showing up <laughs> and risk the event <laughs> totally being wiped out. So that has kind of changed for us a little bit too, is that a lot of the opportunities that we did have thanks to the college system is really not available as much as it has been in the past. So um, so that's what I think right now going into the Olympic trials is just try to get as many races as possible so that, um, you can feel by the time we get to the trials, you're hundred percent comfortable with where you are and you've ran enough races to know, cause you've run races that don't go well. You have an opportunity to evaluate that and then get some other races in that end up do going well, right before you go into the trials. Cause no one wants to go into Olympic trials without a very high level of confidence. <laughs> I mean, I, that, that is one thing that I will say, you must be super confident if, um, you know, when you're going into the Olympic trials, you cannot at any point be second guessing yourself. Yeah. I don't know if, if a person has ever made the team that way, especially not the U.S. Mm -hmm. Olympic team. So how do you instill that into your athletes, the current ones that you have now? Well, um, again, that is difficult because everybody is at a different level in their, you know, their level of confidence, right? I mean, the only thing that I can do is convince them that they're ready, but they got to believe it. <laughs> so, um, like I said, we, we try to do as much in training. I try to convince them as much in training that they are where they need to be. Um, and then, uh, we're going to start racing but we haven't really raced a, a lot yet. So that we haven't even gotten to that point. And then I have some new athletes that, uh, you know, last year started working with me in COVID and we didn't get a lot of races last year either. So, you know, so, yeah, hmm. it, it's I mean, tough, I, but again, um, we'll be ready when it's time. Mm -hmm. I've been pretty impressed by the athletes who have gotten a chance to compete, even though it's limited opportunities. It seems like a lot of folks are still running fast and breaking records and running PRs. So it's like, it's been so hard for everybody, but when they're getting the chance to compete, they're taking advantage of it. And, you know, I kind of like to see that at least it's like. Well, you know what I think that is, I think that is when something is taken away from you. Yeah then you realize how important it is. So you have this group of people who were relieved that there was no Olympic trials, Olympic games. And then you have another group that said, wow, you know, now I realize how much I love what I'm doing. Yeah, I miss it. So, <laughs> A relieved you know, group? If you didn't miss it, you should have already quit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? I mean, exactly. if you didn't miss it, you should have already, this should not be something that you feel forced to do, whether you be, you know, because you have a contract or, um, you know, for whatever reason, my, my family wants me to do it or whatever. You, oh, this yeah. should really, it has, and I, I, I'm not saying it should, it has to be a top priority and it has to be super important to you. Meaning when no one is watching, you're working, whether it's you're watching videos of yourself or old videos of yourself, videos of your competitors, um, uh, working on your nutrition, you know, general strength, anything that you can be doing when you're not at practice and when you're not in front of your coach that you can do that is going to help you be a better athlete. Mm -hmm. 
if 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 other things are more important, you're not going to be doing those things and you're going to fall behind. Absolutely. Now um, I tell so my I want to go back a little bit because we skipped over some of your Olympic accomplishments. So the first time in 92, you made the Olympic team as a college athlete. And then in 96, you also made the um, Olympic team. But even before this 96 Olympics, you went into the 95 uh, World Championships. What were your mental change between being a college athlete at the Olympic stage and be going into your World um, Championships? So in 92 and 93 was my senior year. So that's when I kind of uh, finished college. I did make the world team that year. I was fifth place in world, my coming out of my senior year. Um, the next year was, and it was, a, it was actually a world record race too. Mm -hmm. So in 95, I mean, 93, Sandra Farmer Patrick and Sally Gunnell broke the world record in the race that I was in. And it looked like they were like 10 hurdles ahead. <laughs> and like 10 hurdles on the track so <laughs> so when you're in a race that fast you're like oh I need to step my game up <laughs> um I was pretty young and all that but I'm like okay this you you these these ladies are running 52 seconds pretty reg well not regularly but you know just to see it and to be involved in it's like okay you know got to get got to get ready to be at that level yeah 94 came around and I really was not as focused that year it was kind of an off year no championships and I had gotten grossly out of shape and um then started kind of thinking like I I'm gonna go into 95 and really 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 hammer it I'm gonna do all the things that I haven't done in the past that um and really see where I can take myself in this sport and if not then I need to be doing something different so I actually went into 96 way before that race with a different mentality I was on that uh level where I was it I was going to do really well or I was going to quit and not do it mm -hmm. okay I had had my mind made up it was pretty simple so I really did go into that fall like saying I'm going to make this happen or I'm going to do something different so it was the one time that I really had that different mentality of work ethic. I did, I did say in 92 that I had lost a lot of weight. So that was the one thing I did work on, but I didn't work on a lot of the other things too, that I had mentioned earlier. But, um, so I went into 92, 95 with a really great, uh, mindset of how hard that I needed to work. And, um, uh, I got married at the end of 95 but my husband at the who was my fiance at the time he was playing in the NFL and he was super 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 motivated yeah. as he always is and I would be eating stuff and he's like why are you eating that uh -huh. I'm like what chicken wings <laughs> you know <laughs> I can't get any wings and run the way you run and I'm like okay well maybe I'm going to get a little bit more focused here. So he really did help me a lot to be like, this is what elite level athletes do. Okay. <laughs> Cause I had just gotten away with being talented for so long that um, it was a different way of thinking that I didn't even know that I needed to um, adjust, adjust to. So, um, but yeah, so going into 95, I was um, even the first race out was a really good race for me in that it was one of my fastest openers. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm on I'm on the right track here mm -hmm. um Pan Am went to Pan Am's ran well there and then um uh when by the time I got to Gothenburg there was not one single doubt in my mind that I was gonna lose like none like I would have bet the bank on every single thing that I had that I was gonna win not not even not getting on the plane to go there but definitely by the time I'm, you know, I've gone through the call room and we're all sitting there putting on our spikes and I'm looking around and I'm like, I think I can beat every single one of these chicks. I'm like, okay, yeah, <laughs> it's about to be, I mean, I, in my mind, I, it was done. It was a done deal. And so when I lost, <laughs> immediately I was super, super disappointed and devastated. And then when Kim ran over to me and was like, look at the clock. And I looked at it and I was like, it didn't even register in my head. I was like, what is this clock saying? Like, it didn't even make sense to me. And I was like, oh, like we ran really fast, mm -hmm. right? And so I was like, okay, all right, I'm cool, I'm cool, I'm cool. And then um, 
afterwards, leaving that competition, going to Zurich, which was the next meet, like days later, um, I, they were they were dismissing me. And in my mind, I was like, oh, this race wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for me and her. Like we both, pushed it. Mm -hmm. but that was the first time in my, as an athlete that I realized it is about winning and losing. Okay, mm -hmm. don't be fooled. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely about winning and losing okay yeah. and, that, and that's not to say that um you know if you don't feel like you can win don't try but i'm but i'm going to tell you you're going to get your feelings hurt if you think that they interview second and third place winners <laughs> 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 let me just yeah. let you know that it doesn't even uh, matter if you just broke, broke the world record or not you can't no second. they don't care nobody care you did not win you lost mm -hmm. <laughs> But, um, but it was cool. And, you know, it was so funny. I'll tell you a secret. So <laughs> after the race was over and everything had calmed down, I actually requested to see the, um, the FAT time, you know, like the whole, the yeah. timing. Cause I was like, you know, like, I don't want them to come back an hour later and be like, you know, we made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm telling you my PR before that meet was 53, six. I ran a whole second faster. But I'm telling you, it was it was the mentality, and that's why I try to tell people don't worry about the times, because if your if your main mission is to win, the time is going to come. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if you you're prepared, that race, trying yes. to win, so you, just went, you just went into that race trying to win, and over those ten barriers, you didn't oh. think that yo, I'm on a really fast pace. No, no, I, th that's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm. That's why I'm trying to be very clear about this. I did not care about anything but winning. I don't care if we had ran 55 seconds. I would have been as, that win. as ecstatic because I won. That's yeah. all I cared about was winning. I did not care about stride pattern, stride rhythm, a <laughs> leg I was I was going over. Nothing, no, 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 nothing. I was coming off of hurdles and I was seeing another body and I'm like, okay, this body is too close. This body, <laughs> why am I not shaking this body off? <laughs> Cause she was right there and I'm coming down the, the straightaway and I just could not shake her. I was doing everything in my power to shake her and she kept, she was there and she wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's, and that's the whole point because it was still just about trying to do everything possible to win. Mm -hmm. And that's where the fast times come. You know, when you stop worrying about, you know, where am I at in this point of the race? Am I running fast? A lot of athletes quit because they don't feel like they're running they have this thing in their mind where today I'm ready to run this PR, right? Hey, I'm trying to run this PR. I'm trying to run this thing. And they can, you can feel and tell at a certain point in the race that you're not meeting that goal. Quit. Yeah. And then you just like bail. You bail. Now yeah. in the, in the month, when I look back at the race, yeah, yeah. I was moving pretty fast and I knew it. Right. But, but in the moment, no, I, it had nothing to do with it. I was trying to make sure that I was the first person cross the finish line. And I was judging myself off of the hurdles. I'm trying to touch down off hurdles before everybody else so that I can win. <laughs> oh. You see? So yeah. ultimately, as an athlete, that's what it has to be about. Because mm -hmm. you can't control times anyway. You don't know if it's a headwind or a tailwind or, you know, conditions. You know, some of those races we ran, we ran at 11 o'clock at night in a foreign country, you know? Yeah. And, and, and the people in the stands, you, okay, they like to see records broken, but but they're coming to see the competition. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you could have a exhibition with one person running in their own lane if you're just chasing times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Spectators watch the sport because they want to see people competing against each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. just like any other sport, just like a basketball game, you want to you want to see which team's going to win. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah. still, it's still in the competition. Now, okay, the stats later okay how many how, what did this person score how many rebounds you know all that's later but at the time they're in they're in the moment of watching the game mm -hmm. they're just worried about who's winning at this moment mm -hmm. say it again i said they just worried about who's winning at this moment but now <laughs> after you got second place tell them what you did in zurich oh so in zurich uh, yeah so in zurich i was pissed i was really mm -hmm. mad so i was mad in zurich because Prior to Worlds, um, I don't know if you know Marie Jose Perec, but she's a really successful 400 meter runner. Mm -hmm. And she was being coached by John Smith at the time. And they were making a huge deal about her. She had started running 400 hurdles that year. 
And she had ran some good races and she had run 53 low on, on one of the races. And so, uh, or mid or something like that. So coming into Gothenburg, she had a pretty, a really good time. And she was talking about how she was going to run the double. And so the attention kind of went away from the traditional 400 hurdlers to her, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were in this talking about, oh, she runs 48 and a quarter. So if any of the 400 hurdlers, meaning us, came off the last hurdle with her, we were dead meat. Mm -hmm. That was the theory, the theme. And they just kept saying this over and over and over. And as an athlete, who wants to be counted out? Nobody. So we, we was ready for her in Gothenburg. We was like, I hope she show up for Gothenburg. <laughs> we ready. But then she didn't end up doing it. She ended up running, just running the 400. But oh, then she, there Come was this on. whole thing. Oh, she's running, she's running Zurich now. And we were like, bring it on. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but here's where I got pissed. So the whole draw up to this race in Zurich was Kim Batten and her again. Let me out of so I'm like, okay, now I'm getting pissed. So um, I clearly remember going down the back stretch and I was going so fast that my legs were spinning at a pace that I didn't feel comfortable with. So I actually, in the race, I backed off. I was like, nope, this is not right. I've done this too many times to know that this is not right. I've never trained at this pace. I've never competed at this pace. So I backed off the pace and they just went, right? So then um, about hurdle eight, I started feeling them come back to me because I, I, I was in tune enough to know I, I need to get back on my rhythm. So about, about hurdle eight, I started to feel them coming back to me and then um, they were getting tired because they, they went out too hard. Mm -hmm. And so... Funny enough, coming off the last hurdle, me and Perek touched down at the same time. And I was like, I'm about to tear this 48 up. Yep, <laughs> yep. They, to see. they yep. will never say anything about my runoff off the last hurdle. <laughs> nope. So, uh, so that was, that was the, that was the, um, I ran 52.90. And so I was actually the first woman Oof. in history to run 50 more than once. Oh, oh um, man. Yep. amazing. Mm -hmm. Another. Another yeah. accolade. Was, but again, it was, it was motivation and wanting to win, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. again, well, that a, here. You made an excellent point earlier that I want to highlight because anytime I hear this, I want to highlight it. You know, you said you went into 95. It's like you made a decision. And I'm always saying that to folks, like, if you want to be successful, you have to actually make a decision on what you're going to do. And then every choice that you make, weigh it against that decision. And you said the main difference in that year where you ran faster than the world record and ran a second faster is that you made a decision that you were going to go and win and you changed everything. You changed how you were doing things, eating and whatnot, whatnot, so that it can fulfill that decision that you made. So I think that's important because um, that's a big piece of it. You were already good. You were already talented. You were already winning, but you had to, to get to that next level. You had to stop and make a choice. Yeah, there was uh, a lot of pieces that I had not had in the puzzle yeah. yet though, you know, and I'm going to tell you, it's, it, it's as serious as I was leaving Europe that year in 94. And I wrote a list. I, I, I wrote a list of things that I needed to change there we go. in my life that uh, like a top five list. And I don't even know if it was in any order, but I do remember writing this list of I'm getting rid of this. I'm getting rid of this. I'm getting rid of this. And some of them were people. And um, oh wait, and so some of the so people who so this list were a distraction for me, including okay. people who were a distraction to me. No, that's why I wanted okay. you to emphasize that. So people as well. <laughs> I I think the most the list was mainly people. <laughs> <laughs> people, so people, so you find, so you find that people were a big distraction when it came to trying to pursue your goals and track. Yeah. Sir. Were yeah, they intentionally? For sure. Do you think that this was intentional or it's just, just how they were living no. their lives? It didn't mesh with what you were trying to do. No. Nope. Yeah. yeah. Mainly that, um, a couple of them just had their, their business and my business and it wasn't, 
it wasn't helping them and it certainly wasn't helping me. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so that, that was, um, that, yeah, that was a, that was stuff. I, I was like, mm, this isn't, this isn't going to help me. And I don't see that it's bringing any positivity to me. So I'm cool just getting rid of this, 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 and this and moving on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that as a coach? negative influences on your athletes from other kids that you coach like there's just you can see that this kid could be good y'all got social media (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) so so when when a person wants to be a distraction because sometimes it is intentional and sometimes people just think they know everything so they want to be um the knower of all he or she surveys so they want to give you their opinion and if you listen then they feel great because they feel like that they're, they're all powerful and knowing, right? Mm-hmm. And usually people do not approach you unless you look and act vulnerable, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody is going to hit you up. Uh, if you are confident in what you're doing, you look confident and you trust in the people you're around, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, people hit you up when they think, oh, this person looks a little vulnerable. They'll probably listen to everything I got to say right yeah um and then when you can't find people they'll try to find you through social media or other people around you and start getting in your head and next thing you know you uh, believe in some hogwash you shouldn't be believing and then there's the distraction mm-hmm. okay and then they're showing up in the form of i'm here trying to help you mm-hmm. so that is what i see in in track a lot is that um you have to have a core group of people and that when I say group that could be two people <laughs> that you listen to that you get your advice from um the person at the top of the list needs to be your coach and if you are doubting your coach or you're second guessing what your coach is doing you are in a world of trouble oh I'll say it again you. say it again if you are doubting your coach or <laughs> you got somebody else in your ear <laughs> talking to you about what your coach should only be talking to you about, you are already in trouble, okay? Because the coach does not have to go out and compete. (laughs) When it comes down to it, it's all you. So Mm -hmm. I always say, even with my coach, it didn't matter what my coach told me. I never took a second to say first, does this man know what he's talking about? Before I decided to do it. It's just Mm -hmm. when he told me it, that was it. This is what I'm going to do this is obviously what's important for what he sees. When I ran fast, I was shocked. Remember I said I needed to go look at the- the Yeah, the FAT, yeah. He wasn't wasn't surprised. Of course not. Look, did you see what I ran? He was like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. And, you know? (laughs) I still have kids who- Did you think I could ever do that? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you know how many coaches hit me up after that saying, hey, um, maybe you should come and move here. And you did that in Illinois um, in the cold. Imagine how much faster you can run it if you come to me and yeah, having yeah. their athletes try to talk to me, convince me to make a move and convince me to do this. And well, look who you can be training with. You can come to all of these different suggestions of what I now needed to go do to be even better than I already was. And, yeah. you know, it just that, that was that was never going to be me. You know, it was just never going to be me. So, um, so it was pretty easy for me because I wholeheartedly believed every single thing that my coach told me. And I also believed that he had my best interest at heart. So there was no reason, even if my coach made a mistake, then I knew he didn't mean to make the mistake. It was what he best knew at the time. Right. And we ran it together. Okay. So I'll give you an example in 96, um, I was running really, really fast because I had really worked on my speed that year. I was really working on getting just faster, right? And so we went, they had this meet in Atlanta, the Grand Prix Invitational before the trials and they were, it was the that track, the track that we ran the trial, we ended up running the trials on and then the, uh, later the Olympics, but it was a brand new track. It was a baseball stadium. They laid the track down. I personally believe that that surface was crazy meaning like I think it had a very 
concrete with a thin layer of surface over top. <laughs> that, that mug is fat. Yeah, it's fast. It's, it's, all, it's all bounce, boy. It's yeah. all bounce. You don't want to so, train on it. So I, huh? You don't want to train on it, but you're going to run something. No. Not only that, you know they tore that track up right after we ran in Atlanta. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, they, they peeled that mug up quick. Like, let's get this. <laughs> So and I was gonna second guess this. For, um, the, <laughs> the invitation, I, I could not run on that track. Like I was like, like I couldn't get my stride pattern together. I was chopping. I was getting to the hurdle too. I was like, this this track is gonna be so hard for me to run on. So um, come back. I was telling my coach, and, you know, he's watching. He's like, what are you doing? I'm all over the place. Then we go down to the trials. And it's literally the same thing. Like I'm chopping because I had this stride pattern where I run 15, 16 and come home on 17, right? Mm -hmm. So trying to take 17 steps between the last two hurdles with that much velocity was tough. So we, we talked about it and he was like, I, I think you can come 16 home, which I had never done before, right? So we trained for all going to Atlanta and um, that's what I did. I mean, I ended up doing it in the race but in hindsight, I just didn't have the same kind of rhythm that I normally had. So when I wanted to change gears, I had these longer strides. And then even one of them, like nine, I came off balance because I was hurling with my unpreferred and, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So in hindsight, I could be sitting here going, man, I, I, I don't know why he had me, you know, but what, what we were dealing with. And at the time, I was like, yeah, this is what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And we going to win together or we going to lose together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? that's right. So, um, I love it. No, we going to win together or we going to lose together. We a team. So, um, so even to this day, like I don't ever ever remember one time that I ever questioned what my coach wanted me to do in training, yeah. competing, anything. That's Wonderful. Good. Uh, one thing that you were talking about when you had when you had said that you were taking out distractions and you shouldn't be afraid to eliminate people, um, that draws me to one of the things that you told me as a coach. Well, as when I was your athlete, um, you said that success is like a pyramid, and the higher you get up, the less people that would be around you, and you could just be at the bottom with everyone else, or you can be striving to the top. So it's okay to be a bitch, and. Saying that wasn't about just like having an attitude or anything like that, but it's okay to say no. And it's okay to say, put yourself first. And even if you only have two friends around you at the time, just know that you're going to be successful with those two. Hey, it's lonely so, at the top. It's lonely at the top. It's very lonely, lonely at the top. top. <laughs> and you then know, I'll tell you what, when I made the 92 team, and you know, you know my personality, Ashley. So mm -hmm. I come back, I'm a college kid. Everybody acting funny. I'm like, why is everybody acting funny? You know, so years later, as an adult, I ended up asking one of my teammates, I said, like, why was y'all tripping? And they was like, we thought you was going to be different. <laughs> I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. So everybody like put their shield or armor on like, oh, when she come back, yeah. she going to be thinking she all this. So you know what? I'm about to go on and put my suit of armor on. So, you know, and I'm like, yeah, y'all was kind of clowning. I don't know why all of a sudden everybody started acting like I was different. And they were like, nah, we just expect you to be different. So, you they know, start treating you different. I'm like, oh, okay, well, y'all was tripping. So I moved on. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you didn't even yeah. drill on it. You just moved on and you moved up. Y'all was yeah. tripping. So I had to move on. But yeah, it, it is, it is really lonely at the top. And I, and I don't even only mean in, you know, just in associations, but things that, you know, you can't do what everybody else does. You can't go to all the parties that everybody go to. You can't drink the alcohol that every, you know, like you have to surround yourself around people that have the same interests when you're an athlete because, um, you know, it, it will be tough to maintain your lifestyle the way you need to, you know? Like you yeah. don't see a lot of, a whole, you know, a group of single women and they got the one married lady. Mm -hmm. No, nah. because they out trying to find a man. Yeah, <laughs> that married person don't need to be there. You, it, you know, it's, it's still the same thing. You, you, you usually end up associating yourself with people who have like interests, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so um, 
it's the same when you're an athlete. You have to find people that have the same type of interest or else you're going to find yourself doing things you really shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. Now, I know we glanced well, over it. <laughs> I know we glanced over it, but Ashley, we glanced mm-hmm. over, but Ashley, you did get coached by Coach Tanja, right? Yes, he so, was my college coach. That's right. She coached me to all American honors. And one thing that she also said is that at the beginning of each season, you have to make a decision. And the year when I was all American in the 400, we sat down together and we made that decision. And she told me, listen, if you want to do this, yes, I'll be here and I'll check in on you. We'll make sure that we're on the path every week, but you have to make certain decisions for yourself. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you have to get your weight down. You have to kind of like not be following the crowd and everything like that. So those things that she has, um, the things that she's done to be successful in her career are some things that she instills in her athletes. And I think it's important to have a coach that, well, it's beneficial to have a coach that has been there because they can draw on those references. And it's easy because you believe like, okay, she's been here. So she knows exactly what she's talking about. Um, so you can have your confidence in, in the coach that you're with. So yes, yeah, so a lot of the things that she said that she had to do, I did that with her and I was successful because I followed that. I had to make my decision to make, to be the person that I wanted to be or else it wasn't going to happen. And another thing that she said that I think a lot of athletes and a lot of the people that we already interviewed, they said that they had to make or, or break it year. Like when you went into 95, you said like, listen, I'm going to either give it my all and just be successful or I'm just going to hang up and find something else to do. And there's so many athletes that when they're on that edge of greatness, they make that decision. Like, listen, this is going to be either happen or not happen. So it's a trend with all, with a lot of the guests that we've um, interviewed here. Yeah, I, I didn't, I always wanted to, I, I would see athletes and I'm like, somebody just needs to tap him or her on the shoulder and tell him it's over. You know, <laughs> I just didn't want that to ever be me, right? So I'm like, I'm going to make, I'm going to do this for myself here, right? Um, but Ashley, you mentioned it, but I'll tell you the thing with you two is, you know, when Ashley came to Illinois, she was young, young, young. Yeah, I was a baby. Baby, baby. Very, very young compared to all the other freshmen um, when uh, they come into school. And you had already had a job at home. You had already, um, you know, finished high school, uh, I think even a year before that. So, she, you know, it was a maturity level too, where I could have that conversation with you and you could get it right away. You know, mm-hmm. it, do, it everybody doesn't have that that maturity to be able to get it, you know, because it even took me, you know, some time for m- myself to understand some of the things that my coach was asking me to do, um, even my freshman year with my weight and even into my sophomore year with my weight. I told you, I, I didn't even really do the weight thing until my junior year, right? Yeah. So um, there was things that he was telling me that it still took me a while to like really catch on to say, I really need to get serious about this. So I think that is athlete to athlete too. And it just, you know, some people just can't receive it the way others can, you know? And I, and I think one thing that can sometimes, I don't ever want to say it's a curse because it's never a curse to be talented and athletic, but at some point you have to get out of the way of how talented you are. Because we we all know when you're on the playground or when you're a, a child in preschool, you know that you can do things that the other little kid can't do, right? Like you just know that, that's just boom. You, you, you I can go hang on this thing and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang longer. <laughs> I can do the flip, right? You know, yeah. you, just, you just know it, right? Cause you yeah. can see it and you, you move better. You're, you have more agility. You, you know, you can see an athletic kid, right? Yeah. So it starts there and, it, and it, the more you go through the process of development, you always end up being the one that's at the top of the food chain, whether it's kickball or whatever, you know? So this is kind of something you get comfortable with, and but you can get too comfortable to not figure out where do I really now draw the line in? I can't just rely on, I have this ability and I have to do all these other things for it to work out, you know, because at the pro level, everybody's talented. Yeah. Everybody. Now, still, everybody has different levels of talent, but everybody is generally talented. Um, once you get to the college level, there are a lot of different 
levels of talent. But once you get to the pro level, everybody's talented. Mm -hmm. And so now it just really becomes this very small window of things that you have to do in, in order to really and so it, has to can, so, it has to be so strict and so motivating and so um, intense at times. Like you can't really fall off the wagon at all. You don't, you don't have time to. Yeah. So if you can name five characteristics that a successful athlete would have, that's if someone came up to you and be like, what are five things that you look for? What would those five things be? I think the first thing has to be motivation. That's the top priority is motivation because you have to be motivated to do all the things, right? So all the other list of 20 things, you've got to be motivated first to do that, right? And if you don't have that motivation to do that, and I'm talking about self-motivation, not somebody pushing you, not somebody urging you, encouraging you, just really being like, oh my, this is something. You know how you act when you want something. Yeah. It has to be like, and you know how you act when you don't really want something or it's okay if you don't get it. That's, that's yeah. it. You have to be motivated. Um, I think you also have to have that, um, will to win, which I think is two totally different things. You know, we were talking about, um, the will to win eliminates all the other little things that, you know, when you go into a race, it eliminates how fast am I going to run? What lane do I have? Who's in my race? Like, if I want to win, then I don't care about none of that other little stuff. Okay. Um, I think you do have to have a good core of people around you um, that have the same interests that you do, whether it be training partners, um, coach, family, they all have to be a positive influence, you know, on what you're doing. Um, you definitely have to have a plan. So that would be number four is having a plan. Like, what is my goal at the end of this when this is all said and done, right? Um, because that's where the motivation comes in. What am I motivated to do? Am, am I am I motivated to make the team? Am I motivated to get a medal? Am I motivated to make some money this year? Like what what is your motivation for even doing this? So you have to have a plan, right? So that when you get to the end, he's like, well, did I reach my goal, right? Um, and then I think finally just focus. You got to be so in tune with um, the path, and then that way you will eliminate all distractions. But you have to be super motivated. Nice. And so I had a question for you with, um, you know, we talked about your, I mean, we talked about a little bit of everything, but obviously we covered your very successful career as an athlete, but you've done some amazing things as a coach as well. And, um, you know, there are a lot of young coaches, you know, like I said, I volunteered at Illinois when you were there, a lot of young coaches who kind of mm -hmm. want to get in the game, a, young, a lot of young female coaches who want to get in the game and move up in, in the ranks and, and, and get these positions. What advice do you have for coaches who are who are who are trying to become, who are trying to model you, who are trying to become championship coaches and 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 you know create national champions and all Americans and all of that? Well, I it helps to get in. When I came into the sport as a coach, I came in under my coach, so um, we started out where he was like, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about being a coach. Right. So, um, that it was a process. It, it was three years before I got my own group. Right. And so it was, uh, they used to call me the clipboard girl, you know, people who was jealous. <laughs> they would call me the clipboard girl. Oh, she just walking around Gary's clipboard. And I'm like, Oh, well, I'm learning. So in a couple of years, watch out for me. Cause I'm figuring this thing out. So he would tell me like, I would have to stand around for the shot put, high jump, pole vault, the throwing events. Like we were, it was a single gender program. So you have three coaches in all the events. So I learned all the events. I understood all events. And he said, you know, one day when you become a head coach, if your throws coach get hit by a bus on the way to the track meet, you're going to need to coach your team. Mm -hmm. I'm like, because it's your team. Right. <laughs> so, um, so that was, those were things that it took, it, it was years for me to learn before I actually start. And then I, um, started, uh, working on understanding how to do an entire program and how 
you start at the fall season and how it morphs into what you want to see at the end of at the end of the year so that by the time you're in June at the NCAA championships, you're getting the result that you intended to get, right? Um, instead of you see like these athletes running really fast the first one or two races and then they're either injured or running slow or nowhere to be seen. And ultimately in our sport, it, nothing matters other than the outdoor NCAA championships, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's cool when it's indoor, but Ultimately, <laughs> that's where all the shoe companies sitting around waiting to see who they're going to sign contracts for. And yep. that's where the teams that you make, it's all in June. None of that stuff is happening in March. Okay. Maybe rare few here or there people, but the most, for the most part, you know, it is a long, long process and you need to have the athletes ready when it matters. Right. And that's tough because your athletes are seeing people pop times and they're like, why aren't we running fast like that? And I'm like, because you have to call their coach and ask them what their plan was. Because <laughs> their plan might have been the indoor national meet. Maybe that's, and I'm not saying that's a bad plan. That's just their plan, right? That's not my plan. That's not our plan. Oh. So um, it's hard to keep athletes continuing to stay focused and focusing on what that, the real plan is, which is, you know, months and months away. Um, so I learned all those kind of things. I learned how to... Um, manage athletes from start to finish and that kind of thing. I always enjoy the recruiting side of it. Um, but I think it's important to get under a mentorship and have a couple of coaches that you really can ask questions to. Um, and, and I mean, I mean, questions that are saying, I don't know what I'm here doing here. Help me. Yeah. Right. Instead of going and thinking you, you know, I was a good athlete, so I should know how to coach this track thing because it's two totally nope. different things. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it was crazy because when I, when I started coaching, I realized how much I didn't even know about the team that I was on. Right. So, so the, the team that I was on, I focused on me, the people that was on my relay and, and a couple like, I, I didn't know that there was this humongous different level of all these different athletes there for different reasons. Some people were just happy to have a scholarship. Some people were walk-ons. Uh, some people just wanted to be a part of, you know, this, this whole system. Like it was, there was so like, you can have a team of 50 women and every single person on the team has, has a different reason for why they're there. Mm -hmm. Right. And until I started to coach, I'd never even realized that, you know? So um, that's a lot to manage and to understand and, you know, to figure out how that works. So the coaching side of it is not just the performance you see on the track. It's a lot behind the scenes. It's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And then ultimately, I know for me, the greatest years of my life was when I was in college. I had so much fun. Um, I picked the right school. I picked the right coach. It was just fun. I, I just can't even you how much I enjoy college and I always just wanted everybody else to experience the same thing it's like these are going to be the greatest years of your life so enjoy it so I never liked to see people not enjoying that period because um I, I feel like it, it only goes downhill from there <laughs> so as a college coach craft. make sure your athletes are enjoying their experience learn your craft make sure your athletes are enjoying your experience sure. and find a mentor, and then also know that there's a lot to manage. Mm -hmm. You can't make it so difficult that nobody's having any fun. Not at that level. Yeah. No, that's, that's great advice. Cause uh, I mean, it means a lot. You've, you know, you've done it. And um, I know a lot of folks are trying to get in the game and, and, and that's great advice, finding a mentor, learning your craft, getting good at it. Um, you know, I always tell people to go volunteer, find a, a go, go to a good program and learn. And also you get your foot in the door by volunteering because you volunteer for a year or two. Now you have an opportunity to actually get an assistant job somewhere. Absolutely. You, you don't, you, and, and if you're volunteering under the right person and oh, that yeah. person can refer you, um, you can end up really in a good spot. And, and I've had a lot of experiences with um, uh, people that have volunteered for me where I have talked to a head coach and said, 
what you're looking for is not what you need, but this person can actually give you what you need. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and a, a lot of times, you know, head coaches will look like, oh, I'm, I'm, I, oh, it'd be really cool to have an alumni in this area, or it'd be really cool to have this. And I'm like, nah, you actually need somebody to help you recruit. So <laughs> yeah, this person can help you. This person gonna help you get the talent there. And then you can figure the other stuff out, you know, or this person is, you know, I, I, I try to make sure I always had people that I felt like were smarter than me around me, right? So like a bunch of degrees and smart and together, um, you know, love their family. And if I forgot something, they're the first one telling me, hey coach, remember we gotta do this. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, cool. Hey, remember the deadline for this is this day. Oh, great. Like you, it's, there's so many, there's a million things that you have to do as a head coach. And if you don't have good assistants who have your back and are going to make sure that you always look good, then I never hired anybody that was like a friend of mine that I had already known because that wasn't <laughs> what it was about. I'm like, I want really smart professional people who, you know, when it comes down to it, they're, them having their job is as important as me having my job. <laughs> so you know, I never had assistant coaches where I had to say, hey, why haven't you come to work today? Or why are you late? Or you're not doing this with your athletes? Or, you know, why are y'all having so many off days? Or, you know, or second guessing anything that my assistants were doing. They were always on top of their game. So all the other stuff about how they were dressed and all that, you know, like these coaches be like, I want everybody to be matching. Or I was like, I don't, I don't care about that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> are the athletes performing the way they need to be performing uh, i don't care if i'm matching track meet you know <laughs> yeah so um yeah so you know and then again ultimately we end up having fun actually remember when we did that um that um talent show yeah doc gems oh the, gems. the first one no you were in the one that we won yeah coach Sandra is a definitely a team sport she we did Michael Jackson and she was like the date at the beginning. You know when Michael Jackson had Thriller, he had a date in the yeah. video. Yeah, yeah. So she's definitely a theme. A team I can't player. dance, so I was like, okay, what I will do is I'll walk out and I'll scream and I'll run off stage. <laughs> so she's definitely. So, it was so cute. They had this whole thing down. We were we were like practicing in the locker room. It was so fun. That's yeah. So cool. we definitely had the time in our life for those years. But um, we talked about your um, career as an athlete, career as a coach. What are you doing now? Uh, coaching, coaching professionals now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have seven young ladies that I coach, all Olympic level, uh, getting ready for the trials. Uh, we compete in two weeks at Texas Relays. We had a few indoor competitions that... Um, at a, in a, not Atlanta, it was the American Track League meets in Arkansas. So um, that was cool. And now we're just getting ready for outdoor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell the name of the club. USA Track and Fields put some meets together for us. So it um, it's going to work out. So we're happy to just be able to get back on track and compete. Yeah. Tell us the name of your club and where we can follow you. Okay. So it's the Buford Bailey Track Club. I do have social media outlets, but I really am not as active as I need to be. So I really do mainly stuff on my, my, um, my uh, personal, which is ba at Bailey Tanja. That's my um, Twitter and Instagram. So you'll see every now and then I will we'll put stuff on there from practice and, and stuff like that. But I do need to be a little bit more act active with um, the club social media outlets. Yes. And you can find her shirts on the bit um, at Bailey Tanja and the Be For Bailey chat club. Mm -hmm. social media so yeah I, I have a, um, I have that. a link uh on my um on my site okay mm -hmm. coach I love how you think mm -hmm. your philosophy um even since you know how when you were younger it was all no pressure it's like you you make it fun or you're having fun with it um and even the environment that it sounds like you create for your athletes it sounds like it's fun and, and, you know, that goes a long way, taking the pressure off of folks so they can go out there and just perform and enjoy it. So now that sounds great. Um, I think a lot of us can learn a lesson from you about that and trying to make some of this stuff fun again and, and remove a little bit of the pressure. Um, so I appreciate yeah. you coming on and chatting with us, sharing your story with us. Um, 
you know, it's just so much that you've done. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to, to, to go over it with us. Thank yes, you for thank joining you. our conversation. Yeah. Thanks, absolutely. Ashley. It's great to see you. When are you yes, competing? Um, this weekend in Miami. Here oh, in Miami. Miami. Are you yes. going to compete April 10th? I think they have a meet in Miramar on April 10th. Yes, I'm um, supposed to. I'm supposed to actually open up in the 400 there. Oh, yeah. Allegedly. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, good. Well, thank, thank you. Guys. Next week as well. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you so it, Coach. Much. Have a good one. Have yeah, a great rest of your year. Night. Good luck this season. I'll be in Houston next week, so we'll probably link up. You say you'll be where? In Houston next week, so we'll probably be able to link up. Yeah, we uh, um <laughs> for the weekend. Yeah, pre Prairie View. Oh, that's the third. Oh no, there is Prairie View relays, right? That's the same weekend as no, we're gonna go Texas relays that weekend because it's just oh. down the street from us. This is so much easier. And I have um alumni that um went to UT so they want to run at home so that's oh, cool that's great yep all right we'll see you bye thanks right, thank guys you. thank you bye bye